Okay, so today what I want to talk about is the, I guess we can best describe it as the unexplained death of six-year-old Catherine Corzelius. I became familiar with this case a long time ago when I was a teenager when I saw it on Unsolved Mysteries. It, it's probably one of the... Uh, most mysterious cases that I've come across so what what we're going to do here is look at some scenarios and we're going to deduce like we always do possible to probable to try to determine what happened this is another one of those cases that I'd really like to see the medical examiner's report and I searched for it as best I could I could not come up with anything um, the family did hire a private investigator, but I also read that she was a psychic. And you know how I feel about psychics, but I would like to look at this case for sure. So we're going to start on August 7th, 1996, a very hot day in Austin, Texas. Now, we have the mother Nancy, the brother Chris, who the brother is just a few years older, I want to say, than Catherine. And Catherine, again, is six years old. They're out on a day of shopping. They're getting uh, golf clubs for a birthday present for the dad. The dad, in fact, is, the, is a manager of some sort for John Bon Jovi. They pull in to, and I'm going to show a, a map here of the area. The area is called Eldred Circle. I'm sorry, it's not Eldred, it's Elder Circle. There are about 40 homes back here. Through my research, the average home there is about a million dollars. Very nice homes. Why do I say that? Because it's going to come into play during my assessment when I try to deduce the possible to the probable. They go to the mailbox. The mailbox is at the beginning of this circle. And they get the mail. From what I understand, the six-year-old Catherine gets out, gets the mailbox, gets the mail, and asks to walk home. Home is only four houses away it's a circle okay so there's two ways that you can get home the long way around or the short way mom and son began to drive the long way around daughter begins to walk the short way around it's an affluent neighborhood sparse traffic very quiet and she's done this before mom and son get home daughter never comes son comes in and says hey mom she hasn't made it home yet and she says well won't you walk down to the mailbox and check on her he walks down comes back mom she wasn't there he's kind of hysterical They get in the car and now they drive. From what I understand, I, and I, this isn't clear to me, 
and whether they drove the short way back to the mailbox and up around, however they did it, they find her on the long way around, up here, laying in the road. As if, if she would have walked the short distance, she would have actually went by the house to where her body was located, or for some reason, if she went the long way, the way the mom drove, that's where she was located. In the 1100 block of Elder Circle. She was still breathing by the when mom found her, but she was unconscious. They took her, drove her 25 minutes to the ER, and she never recovered. She died from a fracture skull, and the, the original, not cause of death, I guess, but because it wasn't official, but they were looking at it as a hit and run. Yet, when the medical examiner did the autopsy, they found that her injuries were inconsistent with a hit and run and more consistent with being thrown from a moving vehicle or possibly falling off of a moving vehicle. How the heck did she get here? Let's look at the time frame, okay? They stopped to get the mail at four o'clock. They found her body at 4.15. You have 15 minutes that something horribly tragic happened. Now something horribly traffic can happen in 30 seconds. But in this case, we have 15 minutes to work with. So what happened? Natural death, we can obviously get rid of. She had a fractured skull. But we have accident and we have homicide. Those are the two that we can deduce from. Suicide is another one I was thinking of. We can get rid of that. But uh, we can look at accident or homicide. So right off the bat, we're able to, to deduce down to two. Originally a hit and run. Now, three days later, I want to say, after she died, they bring in some canine units to track her scent. And they track her scent from the mailbox to the short way that she was going home. And they pick up her scent in a vacant lot. And then they lose it. I've had a lot of opportunity to work with canines. Um, not an abundant amount, I'm not an expert, but I've used cadaver dogs on um, one, two, three, maybe four cases that I worked on, and I've used canines in a lot more than that during drug work when we're investigating drugs and I had a lot of confidence when it comes to drug work with canines. I've seen, I've seen them find stuff hidden. It's remarkable. I've had, I have not had good luck with tracking dogs or cadaver dogs. So do I take any stock into them taking her scent from the mailbox to this vacant lot? I gotta be honest, I don't. I don't, but I need to know more about that vacant lot, you know. The mom has come out to say that now she believes that her daughter was abducted in this vacant lot, um, but her theories have changed too, not in any fault of her own. Listen. She she's a victim here as well. Right after this happened, she stated that mom originally stated that she, she believed her daughter was struck by a car going as she walked up the short way, the way that her mom said she was going to go and was hit by a car. The person picked up the daughter, put her in the car, drove her past her home, around the other way, and then took the daughter out later on the road to be found. 
She firmly believes that her daughter was placed there. And then later on, I think maybe after they hired this private investigator, they changed their mind to someone abducted her. Maybe it was after the canine unit got the scent from the vacant lot. I'm going to tell you why I believe we can rule out the abduction and murder theory. First of all, the time of day. Now I know anybody can get murdered at any time of the day that they want, but you're talking four o'clock in the afternoon. It's when most people are, and it, it was a Wednesday, they're getting ready to come home from work. It is an inopportune time to murder somebody and if you do murder somebody when uh, why are you going to place them in the middle of the road to be found she had a fractured skull she had scrapes on her hands her elbows her knees and her back now again I also saw that she had them on her shoulder but until I see that autopsy report, I can't say 100% sure. So, the time of day bothers me. The location of the child bothers me as it relates to a murder. An abduction, a kidnapping, I saw. This is by no way a kidnapping. You don't kidnap and kill a child and leave it there to be found. It destroys the whole kidnapping scenario, much like John Benet Ramsey. You don't say you're going to kidnap somebody and write a ransom note and then don't take the body and leave the body to be discovered because you'll never receive payment. This is not a kidnapping. It's a wealthy area. I said that before. Okay, This is not a, a high risk area for murders. I would beg without even doing any research in that area in a hundred years I'd be surprised to see if there was one murder it just is not that type of area again 40 houses within that circle nobody heard nothing nobody saw anything so let's rule out the abduction murder theory I just don't believe it happened. The fractured skull. Sure, that could be indicative of a homicide. But for what purpose? What purpose would this little girl be murdered for? She was not sexually assaulted. And again, I just ruled out that she's not being kidnapped. Um, you have to have reason. You have to have motive to kill somebody even if it's fantasy if it's gang initiation you have to have a reason to murder somebody this little girl is and when we talk about victimology she's a low risk victim the lowest risk that you could get she doesn't live in a high, she you know a high risk area she doesn't have a high risk occupation her parents don't have high risk occupation um, so you can rule it out. Now, the one thing in victimology that I'd want to know, was she adventurous? What was her personality like? Did she like to play in the woods? Would she go into a vacant lot? All those questions. i never seen answered. I'd want them answered. It's not murder. It's not murder. It's just not. There, there is no signs there that it was murder. Let's go to the next area that it could be. What they originally thought, a hit and run. Now, why could it be a hit and run? Well, the injuries are consistent to me with a hit and run. Now, the medical examiner ruled this out. He said she would have had fractured ribs, her legs would have been broken. I disagree with that. The reason I disagree with that is because we just seen an example just seen an example recently in the news Bob Saget okay 
he dies, he has a fractured skull. He dies in bed. How does he get a fractured skull? I'm looking at that like, oh my God. We're not, we missing something? That's homicide. Luckily, nowadays, we have cameras. We see that his door never came open. He was not killed. He fell, hit his head. Hard enough to fracture it. Can you believe that? And then he gets in bed and goes to sleep. So it happens. Okay? She could, the speed limit in that area, at least now that I see, and I'm staring at it right now, 25 miles an hour. Now at the time, maybe it wasn't posted. Maybe it was 35. You could have been going 10 miles an hour and hit this child and she fell back and hit her head on the pavement and fractured her skull. You would have had fractured ribs. The only way you're going to have fractured anything is if they're speeding and it's a hit and run. This certainly doesn't look like that at all. Could it have been somebody was just moseying around going the speed limit 25 miles an hour Look down to pick up a CD, a cigarette, whatever, and hit the child? Yes. I believe that's possible. Maybe they were doing something illegal at the time. Maybe they were smoking a joint. Figured, hey, we're, I'm going to get caught. I'm just going to leave. It's possible. So I would not rule out a hit and run based off, just off of what the medical examiner said. Let's look at the third, and I think maybe the uh, most probable is that the child somehow got on the back of that vehicle and drove on the bumper until she fell off up here on the long way. I say most probable. How about I just say probable? Probable. Again, victimology. Remember what I just said. I'd want to know whether she's adventurous. I'd want to know whether she's done that before. I would want to know whether they talked about that at the dinner table before. Hey, or they seen it in a movie. Something like that. That she would get on the back of that Suburban, and I believe that's what type of vehicle it was, and then fell off as the mom was driving. Again, I'd want to know mom's driving history. And how do you know that? I would talk to all 40 of those people in that development. How fast did she drive? Was she a bad driver? People know that. Neighbors would know that. And it could have been just a tragic accident. Again, I'm going to show you a video of that route. And you'll see the the curves. So if she is on the back of the bumper and mom is going fairly fast, let's say she's going 35, maybe 40 miles an hour, and goes around one of those turns, the child supposedly had a splint, I believe, on her left thumb, which would cause not to be able to grip very well. Now, in this Unsolved Mysteries episode, I do remember seeing the private investigator showing the back of a vehicle that they had at the time. I believe it was a Suburban. And there was really only one place to hand on, hang on, and that's the handle. And, the, and I guess you could hang on up top if you were standing and grab the hole, but that seemed like a stretch to me because they would have seen her. But if she was crouched down on that bumper and holding onto that handle, the prime investigator said two things. She couldn't hold on because of the splint on her thumb, which I find ridiculous. Secondly, she said if she was holding onto that handle, it would have opened the door of the Suburban. However, what if the door was locked? You can pull on it all you want and it's not coming open. So it's those details. You know, for her, her to say that, I think is ridiculous. The grip. The handle is this long. You're talking about a six-year-old child. 
You're telling me she couldn't stand on that bumper and almost sit down on it and have a hold of that with two hands. Yes, she could. Now, that would explain why her body was found in the complete opposite direction that she was walking. Is it possible that she decided not to walk the short route and instead decided to go the long route? I think that's possible. Now, I want to say that the mother saw her starting to walk the short route. I guess we don't know. I guess we don't know. But I find it very odd that somebody would murder somebody and place them on the road at 4 o'clock. And again, we're talking 15 minute window. Why would anybody murder somebody within 15 minutes there at that time of day and place them on the road? It makes zero sense. Okay? Again, nothing to me that indicates a homicide took place. I believe it was an accident of one sort or another. Hit and run, I still believe, is more than a possibility. The accident of her maybe holding on to the back of the vehicle and falling off, I think that is a very good possibility as well. Let's look at some of my notes here before I... Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to show you that video right now. And I'll narrate the video and you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, so what I want to do is walk you through the route that Catherine would have taken and the route that the mom and the brother drove. So this is the mailboxes where they got the mail, Catherine wanted to walk home. So she would have gone this way, which is the shorter route, okay? She would have came up here. There was a vacant lot over here at the time But we're not worried about that. I want you to take notice, okay? You have a walker there. You're going to take notice of these homes. You're talking million dollar homes. Very nice. There was only four houses at the time until she got home. Now it looks like it's a long way on this map. But we're there. Okay, 809. That's where they lived. That's how far she would have had to walk. But now we're going to go back and I'm going to show you the route the parent took. Okay, now we're back at the mailboxes. Now this is the route that the mom and the brother drove. It would have made this turn here. Now, while we're doing this, I want you to just look at you know, the houses, the area. The greenery, how wide the street is. There's 40 houses up here at the time. Okay, now I believe that the little girl's body would have been found right in this area. Now, I'm not 100% certain of that, but trying to deduce from the newspapers, the one newspaper clipping showed this entrance and the body being near here. You have a house right across the street. Now, if you follow this all the way up around, it's just going to lead you right back to their house. Okay, right now we're still in the 1,000 block. 
The little girl's body was found in the 1100 block where we were. So you can see there's some turns, you know, but the road itself is not at all treacherous or saw one speed limit sign that said 25 miles an hour. Now we're back to their residence, which is right here. So that's it. I just wanted to show you that. Sometimes it's good to get a sense of, you know, you can read all you want, but it's it's nice to get a sense of where you're at. All right, so I mean, as you saw, hey, very affluent neighborhood, not a lot of traffic. We seen one walker or, or jogger in the area. Um, oh, and another thing that I wanted to get back to is how the temperature on that day supposedly was hot. And I apologize, I should have looked up in the Farmer's Almanac the temperature for that day. But I would just agree that it was probably in the 80s, 90s in Austin, Texas in August. The private investigator said the vehicle was too hot to hold on to. I would agree that the vehicle would be extremely hot, more than likely, but that handle would not be. And that's the only place that she'd be able to hold on to. And it's possible that she did that. Now, I want to go over my notes here a little bit just to see if I didn't miss anything. It happened between 4 o'clock and 4.15 in the afternoon uh, the speed limit not an abduction not a murder the time of day we already went through that um, I put in here what to do in the vacant lot I think what I meant by that is what what's she doing if they picked up her scent in the vacant lot again it goes back to victimology does she play in the woods you know you'd want to know that if there was a, some sort of abductor, murderer in that vacant lot, who had access to it? They would have looked in that vacant lot, right? I mean, you look in there for cigarette butts, any other sort of evidence, tire prints, just in case. But again, I think we could go back to accident, whether she's on the back of that bumper or, or hit and run. Now, if it's a hit and run, certainly, you know, you're going to interview all 40 houses and surrounding from that. But I would, you know, you would inspect all of their cars, obviously, but also any workers, any construction workers, any delivery type people from that area. You'd want to know all of that. So I think you could fairly deduce that because there is nobody else that's going to be driving around that area in that circle you know what I mean so you're able to deduce it to the people that either live there have visitors there workers in that area and you should be able to find that out relatively easy compared to being at a 7-eleven grocery store somewhere on the corner of fifth and main and a hit and run occurs okay so I think once you check all that out and realize, okay, their stories line up. There's no marks to any cars. Uh, they have alibis. They were at work at the time. I mean, you only have 40 houses. It's easy to go through each and every one and cross them out. Um, who had delivery workers there? Who didn't? Who was home during that time of day? Who wasn't? Uh, check out their cars for marks. Once you rule, you could rule that out, okay? It's not hit and run. Then you can deduce that to an accident and that accident being her on the back of the car. But again, I think victimology might tell you that or give you a little bit more of an insight to that if you know she was adventurous or she wouldn't take chances and things like that. I think this case is absolutely solvable if they're able to do all that and I'm sure that they have. But just in case they haven't, that's what I would do. So that's it for uh, this really, really sad case with Catherine Corzelius. And I'm hoping I pronounced that last name correctly. Um, such a tragedy. Six years old. 
especially if it was an accident and she was on the back of that car, can only feel for her mother and all of her, the family and friends. Um, just a tragedy all around. I tell you, sometimes it makes you wonder, you know, makes you question things. It's just sad. 15 minute time frame. Everything's happy, everything's good. And then how your whole world can change in 15 minutes uh, of a normal day. It's really sad when you think about it. Uh, you know, recently I've come to a decision that I'm really going to be only do cases that I have interest in. Ones that inspire me some way or another to look at them. And this was one of those cases. Um, I see the smiling six-year-old girl you know and it reminds me of my daughter and I uh, I can't imagine that hurt of a six-year-old and not knowing and that's what I think the victim's family really wants they want to know and, and can you blame them no you want to know so the theories run through your head you know could she have been murdered? Well, yeah, sure. Her scent was found over here. Let's go with that theory. I understand that, and I get that, and I empathize with that. But sometimes on these cases, what you really need, in all cases, is an unbiased, no bullshit, look at the facts. What I want to stress to people is to be a good investigator, I think what you need is you need to be able to think outside the box but not go down the rabbit holes or know which singular rabbit hole you need to go down, if that makes sense. You can make any case into any theory that you want. But if you stay focused, but yet are able to think outside the box a little bit and not go down all the rabbit holes, because it's going to drain you. It's going to drain you of your energy, of your time to go down all those. Stick to the facts. Just like we did on this case, we can rule out murder and abduction because of these scenarios. The time of day, the 15 minutes, the location, the, uh, the placing of a body which you can't say has been placed because nobody's going to place a body in the middle of the road like that when they could just drive off throw them in a vacant lot where she won't be found and the only reason you would place a girl like that is to be found and the only reason you'd want her to be found is one a remorse or b you knew them you knew the victim or knew the victim's family but again it's not murder it's not murder um, that's my opinion and I gave you the reasons why I'm backing up that opinion so just unbiased focused on the facts those facts will lead you at which direction you want to go hit and run uh, murder accidental death the facts will lead you there and I think it did in this case so I think for sure you know hit and run or an accident with her being on the back of the bumper and I would want to know more about victimology more about her as a six-year-old playful girl her habits uh, and what she did how she played I talked to her schoolmates well I don't think she even started school yet I talked to the kids in the area that she played with family and find out those things before I would make a judgment and say yes definitively it was an accident where she was on the back of the parents car going home and again look into the mom's driving history I'd want to know that as well as long as everybody's driving history in that area I think the case is solvable you may never get somebody to confess but I think we're still able to deduce more 
and determine whether it's hit and run or she was on the back of that car. I believe those are the only two choices that we have in this unfortunate and sad case. So, hey, uh, I also wanted to mention that John Bon Jovi did record a song about this because uh, he was kind of close to the girl as well. And the song, I believe, is called 4... 415 87 96 415 or something like to that effect so i haven't listened to it i do like bon jovi but uh i haven't listened to it yet but maybe you should check it out okay that's it until next time mains out oh, fear of